Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, and welcome to Partners in Diversity's uh, Breakfast for Champions. The purpose of Breakfast for Champions is to share impactful approaches to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion. And since the pandemic, we have shifted this program from a quarterly cadence to monthly, uh, all in the goal to help better meet the needs of our members like you during this tough time. So I hope this morning's session will inspire you to make meaningful changes within your organization. Programs like these are possible because of members like you. And I'm grateful to our sponsor this morning, Homes for Good. And joining us this morning from Homes for Good is Bailey McEwen, Human Resources Director. Bailey? Oh, sorry. Hi, yes, thanks, Mari. Um, Hey everybody, my name is Bailey McEwen. I'm the HR Director with Homes for Good Housing Agency. We are Lane County's Public Housing Authority. Um, we're really excited to sponsor this uh, particular event today. Um, we have struggled this year to, um, as far as our budget and being able to give a really thoughtful process. Um, so we're starting early this year in, in planning our budget process and we've been really investing in our equity work um, and developing strategic equity plan to really center our work around racial justice and make sure that that's infused into our budgeting process. Um, so we're excited to sponsor this event and Partners in Diversity events are always so thoughtful and impactful for us. So thank you for having us. Thank you, Bailey. And again, Homes for Good for your continued support of Partners in Diversity. They say that the budget is your organization's moral document whether it is for an individual, family, school, company, nonprofit, a city or state, big or small, it's a statement of priorities and values. It shows in concrete numbers whether you're putting your money where your mouth is and what is most important to you. So an example of a big picture, we're talking big picture, proposed budget that would increase defense spending, pay for a border wall and school voucher programs, but in order to do that, proposed funding cuts would have to happen to support that. So women and children's nutrition programs, food for education programs, international climate change programs, super fund cleanup, loan guarantees for small businesses, arts endowments, just to name a few. And just by looking at this budget example, what can you say about the priorities and values? A budget has profound implications, not just on your own policies and practices, but also on your employees, their families, and the community. So we are happy to have with us today two incredible champions of equity who also happen to know a thing or two about budgets. They will share with us ways that your organizations can shift financial policies and processes during using a racial equity lens as well as ways to evaluate the equity and social impacts of budget re requests, the training needed, and how to involve the community or stakeholders in the process. So our moderator today, I'm very pleased to have Kathleen Key, who will help guide us through a fireside chat with the speakers and provide us with some additional insights and perspectives. Kathleen is the CEO and Senior Wealth Advisor at Confluence Wealth Management, a woman and minority owned business. She has served in this role since 2011 and prior to that was CEO of Pacific Investment Advisors. Kathleen is the immediate past chair of Randall Children's Hospital and serves on Legacy Health Investment Committee. <clears throat> she is also the chair of the Friends of the Children Foundation. She also serves on the boards of the Portland Business Alliance, Friends of the Children Southwest Washington, and is the treasurer for International Women's Forum of Oregon. So Kathleen, take it away. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Mari. Um, I'm happy to be here and uh, to talk about this important topic and to serve as your moderator today. Um, first, just to let you know how the morning is going to run is it, we'll hear from our distinguished speakers um, about their work in creating and implementing a budget equity tool. And then we'll have a fireside chat to talk about some of the issues raised and to dive deeper into the conversation. 
And finally, we'll have some time at the end for audience questions. So again, please use the Q&A box um, to ask the speakers your questions and you can post them anytime during the presentation. So now I wanna introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Dante James, is more than 25 years of political and legal experience. He's worked and traveled for the Clinton administration for almost eight years, leading advanced work nationally and internationally. He served as the appointee for the mayor of Portland, Oregon for six years and was the first director of the city's civil rights office, the Office of Equity and Human Rights. Prior to that, he was the Colorado State Director for the Center of Progressive Leadership. Prior to holding this position, he was appointed by the Denver's mayor, Wellington Webb, to serve as the executive director of the mayor's office of contract compliance, the city's affirmative action office overseeing the utilization of women and minority owned businesses in city projects. After Dante, we'll hear from Dr. Kofi Dassou. Dr. Dassou is the deputy director for the Office of Equity and Human Rights at the city of Portland. He's created and managed the city's equity training an education program in 2012 and served as the interim director of the city's Office of Equity and Human Rights. Uh, during his time at the city, he's introduced and is leading the training of managers of the equity, racial equity centered results based accounting framework, which he'll talk about today. Before moving to America in 2008, he and his wife and four children, Dr. Dessou worked for the US Department State of the American Embassy in Togo for 16 years. So to kick us off, Dante, why don't you go ahead? Well, thank you and good morning. It is my pleasure to be here with you and always enjoy engaging with partners in diversity, uh, certainly when I was in Portland. Um, and it's also my pleasure to be on this panel with Kofi. And uh, I look forward to hearing his comments and remarks, certainly about how the office continues um, since my departure, but I know uh, it's going fabulously as I've continued to kind of keep an eye on it, if you will. Um, so the goal this morning is to really, as, as I think has been to talk about equity um, and equity in budgeting specifically. I'm gonna share my screen um, and then we'll have a conversation. So let me get it there. So um, who I am currently anyway, um, one half of the Gemini group and we're a consulting firm that works around the country with organizations from nonprofits to higher ed to um, foundations, certainly state and local governments uh, and, and private and nonprofits trying to infuse the idea of equity, uh, racial equity specifically into their overall work um, from training to racial equity plans to policy document review, et cetera, and specifically around budgeting. Because as Mari alluded to, if you want to know what's important to any entity, follow the money. And so how do we best do that? And so first, just talking about equity and what is equity essentially, equity is the umbrella under which diversity and inclusion reside. And equity is about outcomes, not intentions. And so how are we ensuring that our budget is providing the best opportunities for the best outcomes for those who we're serving, those who are our stakeholders, our clients, whomever they may be. Um, so <clears throat> specifically around budgeting, there's lots of ways to approach this if you're serious. Um, you know, you can check the box all day and say we've done something. But if you're very serious, it, it is about evaluating how we do our budgeting process, how we prioritize that. And so first is simply, is there any consideration of equity in the budget? Um, sometimes a, a, a step to overcome in the first place, because it's all about sometimes just dollars and cents and this area needs this and we need to make sure that we're doing this. But what is the equity lens that's being put on that? An equity lens is simply a critical thinking tool but if you don't know what questions to ask, then you sometimes get stuck getting started. And so really providing an equity lens on the budget, certainly questioning what assumptions underlying why we think this is a good idea, why we wanna put our money here, how might this detrimentally impact varieties of communities, be it communities of color, be it women, be it refugee immigrant populations, how are we looking at the impacts and maybe unintended consequences of what we do? Um, 
And then during that process, who's asking questions around equity? Your board of directors, um, CEO, city council members, mayor, chief administrative officer, city manager, whomever that might be, who's responsible for asking those questions around budgeting and ensuring that there isn't, in fact, a lens being placed on the budget? Um, how are the priorities decided? What is that criteria for determining where we're gonna put our money or why we're gonna put this amount of money here instead of over here? Um, what is that equity component that's being used in determining those priorities? Or is it just, well, we've been, this is how we've done it, therefore we will continue to do it this way without putting a lens of equity on what it is that we're doing. Um, in terms of the budget analysts, certainly for city government or state government or for government in general, um, but also just private entities, private industry, um, foundations, those who are evaluating the budget. What is their equity lens in the recommendations they're making for a budget, for their budget asks, for their recommendations of budget cuts? How have they put an equity lens on the work that they're doing? Uh, is there a budget map that can show where money's being spent, either certainly for government by geography, where are we spending our money? This area of the city has received this amount of money over time cons consistently, but this area has been divested or underserved and not invested in. And so we see the results of that in the poverty and the lack of you know, street, street, um, street work, uh, potholes, whatever that might be. Um, who's cleaning off the graffiti? Who's picking up the, the dumping, the illegal dumping that happens? Where are the, are the priorities for the budget based on geography? Because geography can often, often be a proxy for race. And then certainly just by department. What, what department is, is important and is getting that money um, as we work with uh, police departments around the country. You know, training gets a little bit of money and a huge pot of money goes to other things, be it you know, weapons, be it whatever whatever that might be, but sometimes training, which is a huge component of the culture and climate of the organization, is not funded at the level that it should be. Or in private organizations, well, we need to do some implicit bias training. Um, and, and we tell folks when they call us and say they want a bias training, but that's the only thing that they're looking at and haven't done anything before that, our answer is no. Because if you want to start with implicit bias, you're just starting in the middle. Because if you don't understand bias comes from, in the history that this country is founded in that then creates the opportunities and, look and, and, and content for your bias, be it the cartoons you used to watch as a kid, whatever that might be, the movies that we see, the, you know, the children's books that we read, all of that is founded in the historical component of essentially whiteness and white supremacy, but that institutional and systemic racism that is been the, been the foundation of bias. And so we don't start with bias at all. And so there has to be a complete component of training in what we do. So speaking about training, what is that training that you're providing, right? Are we just gonna start with implicit bias? And it's not just one's, in, one's personal, interpersonal relationship bias, it has to be institutional bias. Because institutions have bias. And if you're not addressing that, you're not really trying to make cultural change. And who's it provided to? Are we starting with line staff? Are we starting with managers, supervisors? Um, are you making it mandatory or voluntary? And that's usually a, a push-pull in many organizations. Because well, if we make it mandatory, we're, you know, people will be turned off or people, whatever that might be. And we tell folks all the time, don't underrate your, underestimate your staff. Because they really do want to have this conversation. And then, um, what is the connection to the decision makers in the training that's being provided for those who are, are, is the leadership being trained? Or are they stepping back and saying, train our managers, train our supervisors, train our staff, but that board isn't receiving training. The city manager's office is not receiving training. The mayor's staff is not receiving training. What is the connection to the training, to the decision makers in this process? Um, with community engagement. Um, by the organization, and it's not, I mean, community can be defined all different kind of ways. Community 
the residents of the city, the state, or the stakeholders of the organization who are receiving the benefits of your services? And how is real engagement happening? Or is it just outreach, which tends to be a one-way street? And do, do the staff really understand the difference? And is that on engagement authentic? Because uh, you can invite folks all day to offer their thought, but really give it no sense of connection to the decision. So how are you prioritizing and ensuring that that engagement is authentic? You know, the saying is, you know, if you're not at the table, you're typically on the menu. And so is that, authentic, is that engagement really authentic? And where is that engagement happening? I'm inviting everybody to come downtown to your office and do that, or are you going out to your stakeholders into the community so you can have the best opportunity to hear what it is that they have to say? Um, and then, uh, do they have a do they have engagement in the budgeting process? Um, how do they get to engage? Uh, do they get to evaluate some of the budget requests or budget cuts or where the money is going to be or what the priorities are or how the criteria was determined? What is their voice? Because it's going to benefit or be detrimental to them. Are you building capacity in the community as you do this? Um, or are you just always reaching out to the same folks who are often swamped, too busy to participate, or can't fully engage because they are often called to be in many, many different rooms at the same time? And then so how are you building the capacity and the engagement that you're having with your stakeholders or those community members who you're serving? And then is it um, ongoing or is it just a one touch and I'm done so there's no real sense from the community that you're serious and you want to hear from them and build a relationship. So is it an ongoing process? Do you have a relationship before you need the relationship to be there? And that takes time, effort, and energy to be able to do that. And then how do you finish the loop, right? You get information, you get feedback from your stakeholders, from the community, but you never go back and let them know how that information was used. How was their input providing influence in the decision making or was it at all but if you don't go back and provide finish that finish that loop you will often find that they're not going to come engage with you again because they never heard what you did in the first place with their comments and so it's really about building that relationship maintaining that relationship and making that relationship really be authentic and so i'm going to stop to share and just offer some thoughts. Um, as I said, and as Maury said, I mean, the budget is a moral document because it's the, where the money goes that impacts individuals specifically. And so how are you ensuring that there's real thinking with an equity lens about that? Again, an equity lens is just a critical thinking exercise. Um, but you have to have an equity lens of some sort be it around gender, be it around LGBTQ status, be it around whatever identity you want to make sure that you are positively impacting or not doing damage to. Because damage is being done every day because we're not being conscious of how we're focusing our work and where we're putting our money and our resources. And budget is not necessarily about money. Um, it is and it's not. It's about the resources that are provided. Because if you don't have any more money to provide, how do you allocate or reallocate what you do have? Be that time, be that man and woman hours, whatever that might be, how do you allocate or reallocate that? And certainly in the time of COVID when budgets are shrinking, certainly city and state government dollars are shrinking. So don't let equity be the first thing that disappears in the conversation because, oh, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the time, we don't have the budget. And that's usually what happens. So ensuring that budget processes are institutionalized around the concept of equity is a way to make sure that even in bad times, equity is still a part of the process. And that's really, I think the biggest message is that this has to be done from the beginning. It's not, a, let's put the budget together then put an equity lens on it. It's let's do this from the very beginning to ensure that we are providing the best lens for the outcomes that we want for our stakeholders, for our community, and really setting this up. So it's about training. It's about an expectation of leadership. 
that this is being done. It's about leaders knowing how to ask the right questions. It's about them getting the support from staff who understand equity to help them ask the right questions and then ensure that sometimes people aren't gonna be happy with the decisions um, because they've been the beneficiary of dollars and resources for a long time while other communities have not. And so removing some of that and trying to balance it out or even add more over here because it's been disinvested in for so long um, is gonna make some folks unhappy. And you have to do this work courageously and unapologetically to ensure the best outcomes for everyone. So that's my kind of big overview. Um, so I'll pause and say thank you again. And I will turn this over to Dr. Desu to finish up and or add his phenomenal comments as we move forward in this process. So thank you. Thank you, Dante. Uh, and thank you, uh, Partners in Diversity, for giving me this opportunity to share uh, what we have been doing uh, in the city of Portland. Uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, I am standing on the shoulders of Dante James, who created the Office of Refugee and Human Rights in 2012. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to share is the legacy of what he has initiated and the continuation of that legacy. Uh, I'm the deputy director of the Office of Equity and Human Rights. I've been working in the office uh, uh, since the beginning, uh, maybe before <laughs> it was even created <laughs> because I was working on uh, human rights issues, uh, and then the, that program, that department was converted into the Office of Equity and Human Rights because the community has demanded it. So uh, the discussions uh, that I'm going to focus on is going to include the role of the Office of Equity and Human Rights, the city government's commitment to, the, to equity and uh, particularly uh, equity in budgeting, and I'm going to talk about social equity and budgeting process and some lessons that we have learned throughout this process. So uh, the Office of Equity and Human Rights uh, was established in uh, 2011 uh, by city ordinance because community has demanded that the creation of the office and has asked the city government to establish that structure, to clean its own house, that means the, you know, changing or you know, creating policies that help the city uh, achieve equity inside the, the institution and show the results in the community. At the same time, there was a, a process going on to establish the 25-year Portland plan. The plan was adopted in 2012, and it has included a framework for equity for the city of Portland. And that framework uh, set the strategic di direction for the Office of Equity and Human Rights and uh, the other city departments, their roles and the responsibilities. Uh, so, uh, in, you know, in the, the framework for uh, equity, uh, the overall long-term goals are creating citywide equity initiatives, collect and review city data that reflects on and informs equity work, and create an equity strategy for city bureaus and staff. Moving forward, uh, the current mission for the Office of Equity and Human Rights is uh, to lead the city, port, the city of Portland's commitment to equity. Uh, as an office, we hold the city accountable by developing policies, practices, and procedures that dismantle systems of oppression and build equitable foundation for uh, communities that are most marginalized. We center race and disability through education and analysis. We know that individuals experience multiple forms of oppression 
Thus, we drive equity with an intersectional, uh, intersectional uh, framework. Again, the role of the Office of Equity and Human Rights. Uh, we set administrative rules, uh, especially uh, focusing on uh, the Civil Rights Article 6 and uh, the Okay, I think I skipped uh, one thing, the goals that we have established uh, recently uh, during our strategic plan development. We came up with uh, these goals based on the mandate uh, since the creation of the office uh, until uh, now, because there have been uh, uh, many more uh, uh, charges that the city council uh, established for the Office of Equity and Human Rights. Uh, one thing I wanted to say here is that since the beginning, uh, some of the challenges that we have faced were to set the authority of the Office of Equity and Human Rights to really uh, achieve that, that role of holding the city government accountable because there is another accountability structure, which is the city auditor, uh, where the accountability was, is mandated by uh, 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 city residents uh, through election. So our office is an administrative uh, structure uh, because we were not elected uh, like the city auditor. The authority of our office was uh, a, a bit of challenge. So we have been advocating since then for the office to have authority uh, to be recognized by the city department so that we can really hold them accountable but at the same time guide them. So these goals that we set uh, after establishing the mission uh, is you know, to establish an anti-racist intersectional framework and people uh, internal, internal policies, practices, procedures to eliminate institutional and structural racism, uh, to inform, organize, and strengthen relationship with communities who are currently or historically uh, impacted by systemic racism and ableism by aligning our equity efforts uh, with uh, the local communities. Uh, we provide guidance to council and bureaus on ordinances, resolutions, uh, and policies. We develop new equity policies and toolkits for council to adopt and bureaus to implement. Uh, we hold the city bureaus accountable for implementing racial and disability equity uh, goals through uh, policy, education, compliance, audits, and evaluations. Uh, we move the city bureaus into institutional alignment with the express goals, uh, intents and uh, provisions of American with Disabilities Act, the Title II and the Civil Rights uh, uh, Title VI. Uh, so we also build the equity framework capabilities through citywide education and training. And you heard Dante, uh, highlighting the, the importance of education and training at all levels, including the elected officials. So uh, other roles that the office play are administrative roles uh, for reporting and training, language access guidance, online accessibility, and moving beyond compliance is prioritized uh, for this federal compliance. Uh, compliance is just a start. So. Uh, this is speaking to the Civil Rights uh, Title VI and uh, the Americans with Disability Title II uh, Act. Uh, we helped the city bureau, uh, in fact, the city bureaus developed racial equity plans and also had the city council adopt citywide racial equity goals and strategies in 2012. And that was still under the leadership of Dante when he was the director of the office. So there are three main goals. The goal number one is to end uh, racial disparities within city government. To, uh, so there is uh, uh, fairness in hiring, uh, promotion, greater opportunities in contracting, 
and uh, uh, equity uh, and equitable services uh, to all residents. The goal number two, you heard Dante speak about that public engagement and outreach and you know, accessibility for communities of color and immigrant refugees communities. Uh, this is an important uh, part of uh, the goal, which is also the one of the most challenging goals to achieve because uh, bureaus are not used to uh, community engagement that is empowering to, of communities. Uh, and then the goal number three is collaboration, uh, collaboration with communities uh, and institutionalizing uh, equity so that uh, we eliminate disparities in uh, government, uh, all areas of government, including education, criminal justice, environmental justice, health, housing, transportation and other economic uh, areas. Uh, this Office of Equity, like I said, uh, helped the Bureau develop uh, racial equity plans, five-year equity plans for implementation. We also help them develop equity policies through consulting. Uh, we provide education, equity 101 training. Uh, we also provide result-based accountability training to uh, meet management and uh, at, at, you know, top management level, including elected officials. And, uh, and Dante mentioned the role of uh, the fiscal analyst, the financial analyst. We have included them into this training so that they can understand how to show results uh, in uh, people-centered results uh, in uh, the financial decisions. And then uh, one important thing is we have helped the city of Portland integrate the budget equity assessment tool into the city budgeting system. Right now, the city budget office has integrated the tool which is basically a questionnaire, uh, equity questions. They have integrated that into the technology platform that all the financial analysts to use to enter the budget request from every bureau. And this is a mandatory uh, tool. That means every department gets to complete the tool before they can submit their budget request. Now, let me talk about the city government commitment. Uh, the first thing is the creation of the Office of Equity in 2011. The city government uh, has also integrated the framework for equity in the Portland plan in 2012. The city government has adopted the virtual equity plans and goals and strategies as a binding tool, as a binding policy in 2015. And then in 2020, the city government has adopted the result-based accountability framework in 2012 as uh, a framework that every bureau gets to use. That means people have to go to training so that they can <laughs> be uh, effective, they can use the tool effectively. One last thing that the city has committed to is at the adoption of the city new core values uh, in June 2020. These core values uh, include anti-racism, which is new equity, and then the uh, other values that existed before, which is which are transparency, communication, collaboration, and fiscal responsibility. Uh, the good thing is those values are considered as principles to guide uh, the city bureaus. They are not just statement of values, but they are considered as principles, shared principle that will guide the city culture, systems, policies, practices, and procedures. So, uh, the, there is a description, a very clear description of all those values that we are now using to 
uh, develop plans uh, and even performances because we can show how anti-racism looks like in policies, in budget allocations, in performances, community engagement, and other services that we provide to uh, city, uh, the city residents. We can do the same with equity because we have been you know, already working on equity. But anti-racism is one significant values and principles that the city has adopted. Now we get to hold the city government accountable and in how to achieve that uh, as a principle. Uh, now, social equity and budgeting. Yeah, social equity in budgeting, in, in social equity in government first, because we need to understand what is social equity in government. At the institutional level, at the systemic level, and in general, uh, social equity is to replace racist policies, laws, and practices in an institution. At the system level, is to replace racist policies, laws, and practices across all institutions. And at the end, which is the equity part, it is about justice in the policies, practices, procedures, and resource allocations to ensure fair and just outcomes. Like Dante said in the beginning, it's about outcomes. You know, the intentions may be good or not, but if the outcomes do not reflect uh, positive and rewarding uh, uh, results, then there is not equity. Okay, so the intentions, we don't care about the intentions if the results are not rewarding for all people. Uh, that's another way of explaining equity. So in public administration, social equity is about the fair, just, equitable management of all institutions, serving the public directly or by contract, and the fair and equitable distribution of public services and implementation of public policies, and the commitment to promote fairness, justice, and equity in the formation of public policy. This is from the National Academy of, uh, of Public Administration. Uh, another thing I wanted to say about budget as uh, uh, now budget and in social equity. Budgets are fiscal policies. I like to remind people of this. It's there are fiscal policies that generate impact on communities. As a fiscal policy, a budget regulates directs public finance officers and government officials on the distribution of resources. Okay, it's about the distribution. Where is the money going? Therefore, policymakers and implementers should determine how to distribute the resources by asking equity questions. That's why we develop this equity lens, uh, this equity assessment tool for uh, budget proposals. Uh, another thing I want to say is Budgeting is more than accounting. Budgeting is not a simple accounting mechanism. It's a process that reflects the values and priorities of a society. So budgets are also moral documents. Uh, um, uh, this is the third time you are hearing <laughs> talking. About, you are hearing us talking about a moral document. Uh, Mary said it. Dante said it. I am saying it. That means that it is important to understand that. Budget, budget is a, 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 and in public administration in particular, is a moral document. It reflects the values and priorities of communities. So we must do everything possible uh, to reflect those values in the process and the result of our budget. So uh, the city of Portland, uh, you know, has adopted these budget equity assessment tools. Now we have integrated the, the, the tool in the budget formulation management platform, which is a technology platform that is now used to propose budgets. And then there is in that uh, budget proposal, every program, every program has to uh, 
creates an equity impact, impact statement, equity impact statement, impact statement for every program. Okay, so those are the things that we have been doing in the city of Portland. And the application of the result-based accountability is integrated in all that. The questions that we use now in the, in the, in the budget tools and the equity assessment tool uh, is based on this new tool that we have provided, which is the result-based accountability framework. It's a tool that starts with the desired result, okay, and works backwards towards the means to ensure that your plans align with community results and stakeholders driven implementation. Under the result based accountability, we conduct a root cause analysis that helps to design short term strategies in support of long term results. The result based accountability uses collab uh, a collaborative approach to envision specific outcomes through facilitated sessions involving and engaging a cross section of constituents or stakeholders. So it is a collaborative approach. In the result data accountability, we talk about who is better off. Like Dante said it, you can achieve goals. You know, you can build this number of roads and this number of things, but if nobody is better off as a result, or if only a group of people is better off and other groups are worse off, then there is not equity. So all your questions, you know, all your performance measures should have better off measures. Okay. That means that, okay, have you increased the knowledge of a human being? Have you changed the perception of a human being from positive to, neg uh, to neg from negative to positive? Have you changed the behavior of a human being or a community from uh, negative to positive? Have you changed? Have you changed the living conditions of a human being of a community in your resource allocations in your budget? Those are the questions that are asked, and this is the main question. That is, uh, in this uh, result-based accountability framework, it is a rewarding result. It's not any kind of result because there are some results that are reported in uh, organizational performances that are not necessarily better off measures, okay? So your measures should, better off, should be better off measures, not just any kind of measure. So the city audit services has also integrated the result-based accountability in their uh, 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 audit services. And they are training all the city, uh, city auditor staff to master this, uh, this tool so that they can use it effectively to audit the city performances. Uh, yeah, so some lessons that we have learned. Uh, again, uh, it takes time. It took us eight years uh, to get here. Uh, you know, it's better to start with the shared core values. We didn't start there. Uh, you know, now, you know, in June 2020, the city of Portland came up with new shared values as that include anti-racism and equity. Okay. Uh, staying connected uh, with communities. We struggled in the beginning because, you know, we were busy focusing internally and we didn't stay connected with communities. We tried to catch up and we conducted some uh, community forums and uh, stakeholder engagement that helped us to inform the new core values. The core values I'm talking about came out of a stakeholder engagement where we engaged with over 185 community uh, leaders and, and organizations through individual interviews, focus groups, and so on. So those values were collected in partnership with the uh, human resources services and then presented to the city council for adoption. So uh, staying connected with communities uh, is important. Strategic partnership, you know, uh, like HR, uh, the budget and finance departments, the audit services, 
we we partnered with them and our we have now sharing the authority around equity uh, with those uh, departments and then building capacity Dante said it changing people uh, their mindset particularly their mindset will help you change your organization uh, because if people don't change then they will not change the policies they will not change the behavior they will not change the pro the, 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 the practices and they will not change the way resources are allocated. Uh, so I think this is some the end of my presentation. Uh, uh, we our we can share the, the budget equity assessment tool with you. It is uh, available online. It's a public information. And uh, thank you again for the time uh, and uh, your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentations, Dante and Dr. Dassault. Um, they were very informative and um, I'd like to congratulate this to you guys and your department and the city of Portland that um, we're, we've looked at this for many years now and have paved such a good path for um, the city to move forward in your integration and collaboration within your the city departments. What a wonderful, um, thing that you, we have done in the city and I know across the country there are other municipalities and cities that are mod, modeling their programs after the city of Portland so job well done you guys um, so we've have a, a series of questions that have come in I will say that the the slide deck will be available for the participants and so um, we'll get that out to you um, so there are what are the challenges of implementing a process of um, budgeting for equity? Either one of you. The challenges of implementing a process of budgeting equity? Yep. That's a big question and uh, a big answer. Um, challenges are getting budget people to understand that they're not just doing numbers, first of all. Um, which is typically where we have to start. You know, I just crunch the numbers. You send me what the, you know, what we have, the income, and here's what we have to work with, et cetera. Um, but it's much bigger than that. Um, again, if, if the budget is in fact a moral document, those who are evaluating those dollars and where they're going to go are also responsible for having the lens on it to at least be able to say, this is not an equitable, recommendation for more money or less money based on what I'm seeing across the entire budget and across the entire asks from departments, different things like that. So I would suggest a piece of the challenge is really getting the budget department on board with understanding that it's a part of their work. Uh, Kofi? Yes, yes. Uh, I was, yeah, we are on the same page. Uh, there are some financial offices within bureaus who are not necessarily part of the city budget office. They are part of that group that Dante is talking about. It's not just the city budget office, but the other financial offices, they are used to doing things one way and uh, this tool is new to them. E evaluating equity is new to them. Uh, so that uh, they are seeing themselves as incompetent, while this you know they have been you know viewed themselves as competent people in you know uh, creating budgets. Now this is a new thing that they are, they have to struggle with. So those were part of the challenges that we have faced, and I understand. I think uh, Dante remembered <laughs> when we trained the whole office of the city budget office and the director came to meet with us. You know, he said, oh, I understand, but my people don't understand. So I am having challenges there. So changing the people and get them to understand uh, was the main challenge. Another challenge is maybe the elected officials because they listen a lot to the budget uh, the financial offices in making recommendation, but using this uh, uh, traditional way of uh, measuring 
uh, uh, the goals of an organization. They focus on the economic aspect of it, the effectiveness and the efficiency, all these three E's that uh, guide them in their analysis and decisions. So economic means, oh, budget, we have limited budget, we have to balance the budget. Effectiveness means, oh, we have set this goal, we, are, we, want, to, we want to achieve this number of projects, and you know, we are going to use the, the money to do that. And efficiency may be uh, doing the right thing, the best one, saving money and protecting the environment. And uh, the, the, the question that they miss, whether it is at the city council level or the city budget level, is the equity question, the fourth E, you know, who is better off? You know, who is getting more resources? Who is being impacted by all these balancing budgets in achieving your goals and all of that? So again, I'm going to add to what Dante said, the budget officials, but also the elected officials. Very good. Just briefly add, uh, literally yesterday, I was having a conversation. We were um, having a conversation with a board member of a, of a, um, a funder. It's a philanthropist organization. And he is an investment banker. He's responsible on some level for the corpus of that entity, that totality of money that they then fund and give and grant. And he was describing his continuing learning process and having to shift his thinking from it's all about how do we maximize our revenue in our investments versus socially responsible investing and what that means and how I have to begin to think differently because we might, we might receive less return on our money, but if this is the socially responsible thing to do and what the organization is saying it wants now as a value, I have to think differently from my traditional training at Harvard about how to focus on and do investing. So it's a very different way of thinking for money people. Yeah, and a topic that's going to take years and years to, for the awareness and the learning for people to really understand. Right. Um, thank you. Is there an equity uh, toolkit available to the public from the, from the city? Yes, our, all our documents are online, public, public, uh, publicly available. We can, I can send you the links. Uh, that will make it easy for you to find because the websites are usually difficult to navigate. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah. And you know, the, well, there's some, there's a mixed um, folks watching today. And for those that are smaller businesses or maybe have smaller budgets, where would you say that they should start? Well, I think as Kofi said, in terms of the results-based accountability, what's the outcome that you want? What are you looking at and seeing that you're saying is not the outcome that we want? And so then working backwards to determine what is it that's maintaining that status quo? And so each organization, each city government, each whatever is going to be different because of what it is that you do, what you provide, what you, who you serve. But I would suggest first looking at those outcomes that you are wanting, what success look like for your clients, right? Exactly. And is that the real success that you are hoping for? Is it as diverse as you want it to be? Whatever that might, is it, are we serving the area that we want to best serve? So looking at what it is that you want as an outcome and working backwards to see if your budget is detrimentally impacting and maintaining that status quo. Very good. So what I hear in that is that strategic planning in terms of the equity conversation needs to be taking places at organizations. Well, yes. and I think that, yeah, Dante said it uh, at the beginning, engaging with the communities that you serve in, from the beginning to understand their priorities and values that will inform uh, the outcomes that you determine. The outcomes should not be determined just by you for communities that you serve, but with communities. And if organizations need, uh, they just need more expertise because they don't know where to begin, where would you mm -hmm. suggest yeah. the best place for them to access information? Um, well, I mean, it depends. Certainly 
government now, there's lots of city governments, well, not lots, but quite a few city governments that are doing this work and have now offices of equity or offices of you know, DEI, whatever they want to call it. I um, mean, many of that, much of that work is obviously um, public information is available online. Portland, you know, was the third, when I started, there was Seattle, King County, and then Portland was the third governmental entity in the country to do this work. And so Portland's been around doing this work for much longer than most anybody else. Um, you know, there's a, there's a website, um, the Annie Casey Foundation. It, it's a foundation, but it has a lot of phenomenal equity related work. And I believe budgeting processes uh, are also some components of that, um, of their website. So there's just different locations or certainly people who do what I do, consultants um, who can come in and put a lens on the process, on your policies, practices, programs, where the deficits are, what are some of those gaps, and then looking at the budget and seeing how things are, are um, created from, a, from an equity lens. And from a corporate standpoint, do you see that um, there's a, a lot of the leaders are interested and are reaching out to get more information, get more education about the issues so they can bring that to their organizations? Uh, certainly from, from our standpoint, the answer is yes. Since, since the country got to watch a murder of a black man on TV, um, white-led organizations have now had their epiphany that I, there is something we need to do, we need to do it differently. Um, and so certainly corporate America is, I would suggest, the last to get on board. Um, nonprofits have been doing this work. Higher ed has been doing this work. Certainly government has been doing this work for years. Nonprofits are focused more on diversity, which is great, but you can have diversity all day and never change an outcome. And so there has to be a shift in thinking about what it is that we're looking at and what it is that we're doing about outcomes. How do we best serve our staff? Right? How are we being equitable with our staff? Um, because our staff of color are also suffering as we watch this stuff play out on the news every day. It's you know secondary trauma that impacts my ability to sit on a Zoom call after I just got what, through watching a murder. And so how do we serve our staff from an equitable position as well as our clients, our customers um, from a budgetary outcome position? So it's not just a let's improve our diversity component that has to be evaluated. Very good. I'm checking your, the rest of the questions here. Um, so all the information seems to be on the city's website. You know, I think that's wonderful that you have done so much work in this area to help the business community in this case, um, get caught up and, and move forward on this issue. Um, it, it certainly appears that it can't be done in isolation because, you know, we have public policy issues, systems, businesses, the cultures, you know, it's just a massive uh, uh, a movement that needs to take place. And so, um, you know, uh, Dr. Dusso, that can the businesses in the community call your office and you can direct them for more training or more education and other resources as well as the websites that you refer to? Yes, uh, we, we do that. We receive calls from nonprofits, businesses, uh, you know, other agencies that are independent that work with uh, government. Uh, in fact, like, you know, what Dan, Dante said was to me like, it's a movement, it's a global movement. This social equity is a global movement. Uh, and, there is, there, are, there is more information available now than, than one we started uh, like in 10 years, eight years ago. So there are uh, people who are now uh, specialized providing that service you know, as independent uh, consultants. There are government agencies that are uh, willing to share their resources like the city of Portland and our knowledge. Uh, I've been called to present, uh, you know, to Canada, the UK, and then around other, <laughs> other, other uh, cities and uh, states. Uh, you know, 20 minutes presentations, uh, but you know, the, 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 the deep work needs to happen with a consultant who will you know, work hands, uh, 
hands on on specific issues. Uh, yes, so there, yeah, we, we do that. And, and I, one thing I wanted to say is that so it's usually uh, movement starts, you know, maybe in government, then the other stakeholders like businesses, nonprofits, uh, education, they take it on and then the movement becomes big and it becomes the culture of a whole nation or the, the whole world. And I've seen uh, universities uh, in, engaging in this movement. They have contacted us, uh, you know, in the past Dante used to go to the University of Oregon and, you know, all these uh, Portland State University. So it is a global movement. Uh, and we believe that even businesses will take this movement uh, to, uh, I mean, in a faster pace, you know, you know, business, they move faster than government. So <laughs> when once the movement, businesses take it, it goes faster. So that's what I wanted to add. Very good. How do you determine what stakeholders or what community members to include in the process? I mean, you mentioned that some people in departments don't understand equity. Um, and how did you get them to understand um, the issue and what sort of training did you provide? Okay, the response accountability uh, is very heavy on community, you know, community. I mean, it's a collaborative approach. Okay, so when teaching that, the first thing we start with is, you know, the population result statement. That is not just the responsibility of one agency. So when you are able to, uh, to state that population result, then you can see that all stakeholders have a role to play, okay? the people that you have never talked about, then you, you understand that you have to collaborate, partner with all agencies. Let's use the example of safety, okay? We want all people in Portland to be safe or to feel safe. The, the lesson that we learned from the COVID-19 is that Public safety or safety is not just the work of the police or the fire department. Because traditionally, when we mention safety, people automatically think about police and uh, uh, fire department. With COVID-19, we are talking about safety. Then you realize that businesses, individuals, education, the federal, the state, all agencies should partner to work together. So the result is accountability is one tool, one training that help us uh, to help people to see how, you know, to how to identify the stakeholders and see the different roles that they can play in every result that you want to achieve. And I would suggest also that in terms of training those folks who are challenging, um, you know, first and foremost, we start with leadership, be it board of directors, be it C-suite, be it whatever, whoever that might be, um, because the leadership has to make it very clear that this is the value of our organization now. And we support it. We're going to be expecting it. And this is what our expectation looks like. And so... And we're very clear in our training that with, with line staff or whomever, you know, you can walk on that's in the training on the zoom call, whatever, and walk out believing whatever you want. You don't have to agree with any of this, but you need to understand that from eight to four, nine to five, 11 to seven, it's now a value of the organization where you work. And so the expectations of your leadership, your manager are that this was a part of how you do your work. And you know, go home, believe whatever you want, but the expectation is, and the performance management process is, that this is expected to be a part of your work now. And how would you, do you have any suggestions on how um, you, we would make a tool like this sustainable over time? It, it just becomes a part of how you do what you do. 
this shouldn't make any difference who's in whatever leadership seat because it's embedded in the work that the organization does. It's just embedded in the way that we look at our money. It's embedded in the way we put our budget together. The way we, the way we evaluate our budget now is just, this is the normal course of business. And so just like you create a new habit, it takes a minute, but you have to continue to do it with the expectations that this will be done. And so um, it just becomes, uh, when I was in pro, I always, I always used to describe it as, it needs to become like recycling. At first, when recycling first came out, people were pissed off they had to separate their trash. And now people are upset when there's not two or three different trash cans so I can separate and put my, my juice bottles over here. So it has to become that way, just the normal way we do things without thinking because that's the expectation and that's how we do it. Very good. I mean, as a business owner, I would say definitely it needs to start at the top for some organizations because, um, you know, whatever values and uh, strategies that we put in place needs to come from the top down and in order to engage the entire organization. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dusso, did you have something that you wanted to say? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, making sure that the, the, the top leadership uh, understands and also is on board and also commits to the new approaches. Then create a cohort of mid-management uh, officials, multiple cohort, to master the tools that you want to institutionalize, you want to integrate. That will help to continue uh, uh, using the tool. Uh, so, you know, yes, the top leadership is on board, they understand, this is good. Uh, in the city of Portland, we even had the city government, the city council adopt this tool as uh, a tool that every bureau gets to use to when they are developing policies, when they are developing their budgets, when they are developing their performance measures. Okay. So, and then the city auditor office says, okay, now that the city has adopted it, we are going to hold them accountable based on their own resolutions. Okay. So, the laws, education, you know, awareness, showing them what is good. Uh, you know, that is good to use this. I think that will help, uh, you know, uh, really integrate the tool and continue using it. Very good. So I hear from both of you, the challenge for all of us is to continue to put pressure on our organizations to do something, uh, to talk, continue to talk about it in our professional networks, our social networks. We just need to continue to uh, move forward. And, you know, instead of having 100 people on this call, we would have 500 people on this call. And you know, keep doubling the number of people that keep talking about it and moving forward. So Mari, I think that's the, all the questions that we have. So I'll kick it out over to you. Great, thank you. If I can get my camera on. Yes, thank you Dante, Kofi and Kathleen for being here today and sharing your insights on the importance of the budget as a moral document. So today's discussion is a reminder that there are many ways across our organizations where we can insert an equity lens. And as Dante said, let's do this work courageously and unapologetically. And to the attendees, I wanna thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, today's conversation is only the beginning and I hope you'll take what you've learned today and apply it in your workplace. Uh, so please, we always like to know how you felt about our program. So please take a few minutes to send us your feedback. A link to a short survey will appear after you leave this webinar. It's also being posted in the chat box. So again, thank you very much to our presenters today and um, for all of you to uh, be here today. So hope you have a good day. Thank you.